In the past three days of the conference, we've heard a rich set of discussions on the effects of COVID, but also the implications of the pandemic for development moving forward. The panels and keynotes in the conference have covered a range of issues and themes from debt, gender inequality, extreme poverty, food insecurity, informality, domestic resource mobilization, the environment, governance, and many other issues. We also learned about the effectiveness of policy responses that we've so, seen so far in the Global South, and also the regional dimensions of the pandemic in East and South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Latin America. In this closing panel, we brought together a set of leading thinkers to discuss how COVID-19 is changing development. The panel will take stock on what has been learned about the effect of the pandemic on the lives and livelihoods of citizens in developing countries. The panel will also look to the future and assess how the pandemic may affect global development in the years to come and the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Let me now introduce the panelists in the order that they will speak. Marty Chen is the first panelist. She's a lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School and senior advisor of the Global Network, Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing, WIGO in short. An experienced development practitioner and scholar, her area of specialization is the working poor in the informal economy. Marty was awarded the Padma Shri by the government of India. She's also chair of the wider board. Second panelist is Fatima Denton. Fatima is the director of the United Nations University Institute for Natural Resources in Africa, UNU Indra. She has depth of expert expertise in natural resource management, as well as deep knowledge of research and policy development in the African region. Prior to joining UNU Indra, Fatima worked with United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, UNICA, in Ethiopia since 2012. Our third panelist is David Hugh. David is Professor of Development Studies at the, Institute, at the University of Manchester, where he's Executive Director of the Global Development Institute and CEO of the Effective States and Inclusive Development Research Center. He's worked on rural development, poverty and poverty reduction, microfinance, the role of NGOs in, in conflict and peace and development, environmental management, social protection, and the political economy of go, uh, global poverty for more than 30 years. Our fourth panelist is Rohinton Medhora. Rohinton is president of CIGI, a think tank based in Canada. Rohinton sits on the Lancet and Financial Times Commission on Governing Health Futures 2030, as well as the Commission on Global Economic Transformation, co-chaired by the Nobel Economics Laureates, Michael Spence and Joseph Stiglitz. He serves on the boards of the Institute for New Economic Thinking and the McLuhan Foundation, and is on the advisory boards of the WTO Chairs Program, UNE Merit, and the Global Health Center. Welcome to all of you. I'm going to ask the, each of the panelists a question to motivate the discussion. Each panelist will speak for about five minutes, which will leave around 20, 25 minutes for Q&A, and we hope to get several questions in the Q&A session itself. So let me move on to the first question, that's to Marty. Marty, my question to you is, we heard from the UN Secretary General many times that we need to build back better. So how can the developing world build back better? What can the policy community do in this regard? Marty, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Kunal, for this opportunity. As you mentioned, we are all painfully aware that the COVID pandemic recession um, has led to major reversals in poverty reduction, in reducing hunger and inequality. So the premise of my brief remarks is that supporting informal workers who represent the majority of workers to recover their livelihoods is a key path to again being on the path to reducing poverty hunger and inequality, but also to economic recovery. And this is because we now know that 61% of all workers globally are informally employed, and it's 90% of workers in developing countries, a total of 2 billion workers. We also know that most informal workers are from poor households and disadvantaged communities but we also know that their earnings 
contribute to keeping their households from extreme poverty and in many cases to helping their households move out of poverty. And we also know that informal workers contribute to the economy and to society. Uh, they produce goods and services at low costs for formal firms, for domestic and global supply chains, uh, for the general public, and for low income communities. But pre-COVID, they were widely stigmatized. They were stigmatized as being non-compliant and yet are outside the reach of the state. And yet every day on a regular basis, they faced harassments, they faced bribes, they faced confiscation of goods, evictions. Uh, they were also stigmatized for having low productivity, for being a drag on the economy but they were seldom given any support to increase their productivity and were excluded from economic plans and policies. And they were often even penalized or criminalized for trying to earn an honest living. The COVID pandemic recession has shifted our focus a bit or our thinking a bit because it's now widely recognized that the crisis disproportionately impacted the informal workers because they could not work remotely and that they faced almost immediately with the lockdowns last year a triple crisis of food of uh, sorry work income and then food insecurity and in order to cope they became deeper in debt drew down savings sold or mortgaged assets and became triply handicapped for recovery uh, some re received relief in the first wave, but it was inadequate. And few governments are continuing relief till now. So actually for most informal workers, we have done a longitudinal study. The situation in 2021 is worse than in 2020. And making matters even worse, informal workers have not been targeted in economic recovery schemes. And they find it very difficult to access or afford um, any of the <laughs> what's on offer. Um, and so um, we, we really need as a global community, the international policy community and national governments, we have an opportunity, we have a choice uh, to build a better new deal for informal workers who constitute the majority of workers, the majority of the working poor, the broad base of the economy by rebuilding economies from below rather than from top down and thereby reducing poverty, hunger and inequality. And this better new deal for informal workers does not require a lot of additional finance. What it requires is a change in mindset the fundamentals, the three fundamentals of this new deal, a better new deal, are to recognize and value informal workers for their economic contributions, integrate their informal livelihoods into economic plans and policies, and address the structural constraints, the risks and biases faced by informal workers. And the two principles of a better new deal are first, and foremost, do no harm. Stop the harassment, bribes, confiscations, and evictions, and reverse the negative narrative, um, the stigmatization. And the second is nothing for us without us, the motto of the global movement of informal workers, which is that they would like a seat at the policymaking table when recovery and regulatory uh, reforms are being planned. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. This is, of course, the important question here is that, you know, the slogan, I mean, or rather the, the mantra, build back better, how long will policymakers think, keep that in mind? So that's important and we need to get back to that really important question in the Q&A. So let me move on to Fatima now. Uh, Fatima, um, from your vantage point as a director of one of the leading institutes on natural resources in the global south, what are the lessons from the pandemic 
on how human beings should interact with the natural world. Thank, thank you, Kunal. Um, can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. Thank you, Fatima. Go ahead. Okay, and thank you very much, and thanks for the opportunity um, to be part of this conversation. Um, let me sort of start by saying that to a large extent, um, COVID has been some sort of a double-edged sword. Um, in many ways, um, beyond the devastation that we have witnessed in terms of loss of human lives, there is a sense that it has been hugely disruptive um, to development processes. Um, we're already experiencing problems related to an SDG implementation deficit. Um, I think that deficit is even reinforced uh, now with COVID. But let me say why I think it's a double-edged sword. It's a double-edged sword in a way because it has disrupted a lot of the development processes, um, the SDG being one of them. Um, and it's, um, it's a double-edged double -edged sword in the sense that um, beyond the disruption that we have seen, as I've mentioned, um, it is also a litmus test um, in many ways for us to see whether we're properly aligned with the development ambition that we have. Um, and I, 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 I have to say that on the latter, um, one observation that we can do the pandemic um, is the fact that when I look at the area where I'm most active in terms of natural resource management and climate change, I have to say that the level of our ambition for a carbon neutral um, is not very well aligned with our business model. Um, and in many ways, COVID has made that very clear, um, that we're way behind in terms of where we want to get to. Uh, we're way behind because, like, like I said, the business model is not well attuned to where we're headed. Um, our supply chains um, have shown that they are rather vulnerable and rather weak. We don't have sufficient buffers. Um, and we are not sourcing our goods close to home. And uh, we've seen how many of these supply chains have been broken. Um, I think Marty has um, said a lot about the informal sector um, who are off the sidelines. They often peripheralize. Um, they are often on the margins of development, um, even though they have a huge role to play in the development process. The tools that we need to get us to a safer growth, the tools that we need to get us to a carbon neutral future, the transitional drivers that we need are not in place. Um, these are all part of um, why COVID has been such a, such a disruptive element and has failed that both for the developed world and the developing world, we are woefully under, um, underprepared or ill-prepared, I would say. Um, if this is an induction course, if it's a, uh, if it's a rehearsal, we failed um, because we were so not prepared for it. Um, let me make two points um, in terms of that lack of preparation and where it's most visible. Um, the first thing I would say, especially when we look at the... Um, the state of affairs where climate change is concerned um, is that we, we saw a massive, um, I would say, decline in terms of energy investments, um, a massive drop in terms of um, the demand for energy. But we are also now seeing a rebound, a rebound, I'd say, in terms of that very energy, um, especially in terms of fossil fuels. So on the one hand, I was almost tempted to say that it has changed the landscape, um, the, the energy landscape uh, um, um, as it is. But on the other hand, I think it's fair to say that we are seeing some sense of rebound. Um, and I think what is a bit worrying is the fact that the energy, which I would say to a large extent is the culprit um, of heavy in, um, emissions, um, in other words, in the, 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 the current state of climate crisis is as a result of that energy system in itself. That's the very energy system that is a barrier to how we could get to a safer growth, how we could build back better. Um, because as I said, fossil fuel is still the dominant fuel. We are using fossil fuel 
for in the petrochemical uh, industry, in the transportation industry, um, in the energy sector in itself. So fossil fuel hasn't actually become the subordinate fuel um, in spite of the crisis and in spite of those Im initial observations that we saw. So this is a problem. And it's a problem precisely because the countries that are facing dire energy poverty, that desperately need this energy for their development processes, for industrialization, those countries themselves are very much inclined to move towards fossil fuel energy sources. Even though we know that the cost of renewable energies are, are coming down, but there are issues around the upfront capital cost um, of renewable energies in terms of the massive penetration of these energies. We're not seeing enough of that. So the, the scalar effect that we need to see is not quite there yet. So that's one, um, one example. The other example I would say um, is that countries in Africa especially are now hugely indebted. They're already carrying this debt burden. Uh, which means that the very technologies that they would need to be able to get to that transition um, process is already in itself constrained because they have to go back into further debt. And very often they have to go to the same lenders. So that's a problem in itself in terms of the, the justice aspect of climate change, in terms of the equity aspect of climate change, and in terms of the transitional processes. We're not all at the same starting Point. We're not all at the, same, at the same level. Our transitional tools are not the same. We do not all have the capacity, the infrastructure, the resources, the knowledge to be able to get to a faster transition pathway. So I would say that this um, is, a, is a problem. It's a problem also because many of the countries in Africa are very tempted to, to use cheap coal, you know, and, and there are examples, Zambia, Zimbabwe, to use cheap coal than to go towards renewable energy sources. Uh, they, they have a constrained space with, with regard to fiscal loss because many of them would have gotten quite a lot of funding coming or, or resources um, coming from the exploitation of their energy resources. And that in itself was helping with some of the strategic um, investment in Ghana, the um, oil revenue was supporting free education, high school education. In Angola um, and Mozambique, some of the oil revenue was also supporting health infrastructure. Um, so we're not going to see that to the extent that it was made possible. So this, I think, is a, is a huge problem. Let me say this last point and stop there. If we don't take equity seriously in the transition process, we'll, we'll, we'll have to get back to status block. Um, because equity is a, is a very divisive point, but it's also a make or break issue. And if we can say from a developing country perspective, if we are asking Africa, be the first continent that away without its coal and its gas and its oil, there are very good reasons why Africa should do this, because there are benefits to going the green pathway um, trajectory. But if we're asking Africa as the first continent, continent to develop to be some element of solidarity to ensure we need to get to that track should be made available. And right now the build back mantra, you know, is very um trick. You know, much of the risk should really help in terms of getting there. Um, are not in place. Um, so we are way behind of a level of, a level of ambition we actually want to do with that ambition. So these are some of the difficulties that we're having currently, where I would say that um, it's, it's going to set us behind. Um, and those countries that are already constrained are going to find themselves even more constrained. And they would have to draw on the constrained resources that they have to be able to get further further along in terms of the carbon neutral um, pathway. Uh, Fatima, thank you so much. I mean, you raised a very important point about equity and with COP26 coming, uh, coming up very soon. The question really is how will the international community exactly help, as you said, especially African countries in this transition? Oh.
towards carbon, towards what's more more uh, renewable energy, for example. So that's something to be, we need to get back to again in the in the Q and A. I'm going to move on to now to David Hume. David, the pandemic has been a global phenomenon. Practically no country, rich or poor, have been spared. So to what extent has COVID-19 accentuated the case for a global rather than international development paradigm? What would be a response to, to that, to this question? Should we think about a global development paradigm rather than an international development paradigm? Thank you, David. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, and no, I'll make the case for certainly a, a global development paradigm, but I mean, just uh, I think what we've heard from Fatima and, uh, and Marty is um, great in that, but we, we must be reminded about the micro too and the fact that there are millions of deaths in individuals of families and 150 million people who are now in deep poverty um and uh, and suffering and that and we have to i think keep on going back to that and we need to use the statistics but just realize the volume of human suffering that has been generated and has not been managed effectively and how we need to to stop that um that, that suffering um but I'd make the case that actually, and I was looking out when I was looking at some of the conference documents, which are talking quite a lot about global north and global south. But when we look at the outcomes of the pandemic and when we look at the processes underpinning it and the processes that are evolving, then the patterns are really complicated. There's been quite a complicated geography in a way of outcomes on lives and livelihoods. And then there have been these two, three, four waves, which have meant that countries that appear to be successful suddenly uh, are no longer successful the processes that seem to be uh, helping or hindering um, are, are, are swept away and so I, I think we do need to focus much more on the messy nature of global development these complex webs of relationships flows of finance flows of people flows of goods and services data technology and ideas and some of these ideas are about pandemics, but many of the ideas are about things like neo-populist and right-wing politics that have spread around the world and have really shaped very greatly how the uh, pandemic has been um, responded to. And I think that in a way, the convenient binary framework that we still tend to use in development of looking at the global north and the global south, but not being able to quite uh, define those, we really need to move away from that and recognize that whilst uh, there are great differences that putting these into a binary can be um, very dangerous. And I was looking at some of the recent writing um, on the pandemic and there's a lot of uh, well-intentioned analysis of vaccine apartheid and it is horrendous how little vaccine is getting through to Africa but apartheid in a way suggests black white suggests Europe African relationships but if, to understand what's happening you've got to look at China you've got to look at India you've got to look at Russia and the Sputnik vaccine and you need to look at this much more complicated uh, set of patterns that we've got I think if one looks at those then one can see the way in which certainly um the COVID-19 the pandemic is sort of deepening and accelerating quite a few of the development um processes um innovation and research and development uh, the development of the vaccines is no longer based in North America and Europe as it usually would have been. It's also occurring in China extensively. India is incredibly important in the manufacturing and the production and its global value chains um, of the vaccines. And we have the Russian Sputnik uh, vaccine there. So we need to recognize that the old North and South is certainly not the uh, convenient way that it used to work. If we look on influence on these processes, then really, the US has tended to opt for the sidelines in terms of global leadership um, over the pandemic. China has perhaps had the chance to take on more of a leadership role, but hasn't aggressively um, pursued that uh, it, 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 at the present time. But in a way, the old patterns, the hegemony that used to be talked about by many writers of the US and of uh, European, uh, Western European and North uh, American companies um, is no longer the case. These global value chains are much more uh, complicated. So uh, I, I really do think that we need to think in terms of global development to understand what's been happening and what could happen in the future. 
when we look at, at these and certainly what's been happening in terms of sort of outcomes and contributions to the debates, then I think governance comes out um, incredibly importantly. And one can see the way that if one looks um, at the outcomes, then it's not there's been a set of outcomes in the global north and in the global south, but we've had the pandemic badly managed in the north, um, as in the uh, USA, as in the UK, uh, badly managed in the South, certainly in Brazil and Peru, and many of the Latin American economies are coming out very bad if you look at mortality or if you look at the impact on GDP. But we've also had effective management in, uh, in countries that are, are emerging, in Singapore, uh, in China, um, and in countries which are lower middle income. Vietnam and Senegal have had pretty effective uh, responses. And so these patterns suggest that we simply cannot put things into global north and global south boxes. We need to be looking at these much more varied patterns and the way in which one can get effective governance, one can get governments that can hear what science says and respond to it, as in the case of Senegal, as in the case of Vietnam, which have relatively limited resources. And and one can get governments in the USA in particular with enormous wealth, enormous resources, but not able to hear what the science is saying. Partly the problem of the government, partly a problem of the public understanding of science and the way in which uh, publics are behaving. I think a really important question probably for the evolution of global development in the future is the degree to which in democracies that have had poor performance in terms of managing the pandemic is whether the populists who have led those countries manage to get away with it, whether democracy has the power to hold them to account or whether they can blame it on the China virus, whether they can blame it on the scientists, whether they can blame it on variants coming from other countries. And I think we'll have to see how well democracy can perform with that. I mean, the final point I'd, uh, I'd make, I've gone for my three Gs. Let's think global development. Uh, let's think, make sure we think about governance and the way that leads to these very different processes apart from wealth um, in these patterns. And it's about the gaps and particularly about the multilateral gap. And the key thing in a way that comes out is that even though we've moved from the international development, the global north dominating the development agenda, saying what the millennium development goals would be, uh, aid financing shaping development with the SDGs we've moved forward to the whole UN membership saying what development is we've moved forward to development finance being important not just foreign aid from richer um, countries but we still have a multilateral gap we still can't mobilize the multilateral action that is needed and um, the sheer lunacy um, of this at the moment Many high income countries are looking at the booster vaccination, the third injection, um, but we know that that means that the opportunity for mutation and new varieties in countries that haven't got high access to vaccines uh, puts, puts our own populations to threat in the future, as well as leading to greater suffering in countries that haven't got higher access um, to um, to the vaccine. So I really think we need to look at this multilateral gap, uh, particularly in terms of public health. And we need to certainly make sure that the emphasis on private health and individual health, which has tended to evolve over the years, that we realize now that public health is good for individuals as well as for populations. And we also need to think about social protection. Uh, get the ideas out like universal basic um, income because we found that you can't switch suddenly into social protection when the pandemic happens in the same way as we found out back in the finance crisis of 2007-8. You can't suddenly switch to it. And we need to think about how we can get systems of social protection working around the world that will give us the tools to deal with the next crisis uh, that comes along. Thanks. Thanks, David. Let me move on to Rohinjan straight away. Uh, Rohinjan, we already had heard already the discussion about inequality, inequities in the global economy, and and uh, and, and and in the, in the global in, uh, infrastructure in, in architecture itself. And I think that's a really important question that I would like you to address. So, how can the international architecture be improved to address the glaring inequalities that we've seen um, around vaccine distribution, around macroeconomic imbalances? What would, can we do better on this, on this regard? Thanks, Rohan. Great. Well, Kunal, first, 
thank you for having me uh, at your conference, even if, if it's virtually. It's always good to be with you and colleagues at WIDER. Um, you know, a few days ago, uh, we, we, the global community, delivered its five billionth dose of the vaccine. And so there was some cause for celebration, but also analysis and alarm. And that goes to, to the heart of your question about uh, vaccine inequalities and macroeconomic imbalances. Because the way those 5 billion doses have been administered is interesting. If you look at the number of doses per 100 eligible population, for high income countries, it is 108. In other words, many people have been double vaccinated. For upper middle and income countries, it's about 102 per 100 population. Again, um, healthy levels of vaccination. Lower, in, lower middle income countries, 32 per 100. And low income countries, 2 per 100. So that is the stark sort of reality that we face when it comes to imbalances. This is both a medical and public health imbalance, but it is also a macroeconomic imbalance. So let me sort of treat each of those in turn. Um, I, I should say that in the first, you, you mentioned the architecture that we have, and David talked about it too, uh, others have as well. You know, in the first three and especially three to six months of the crisis last year, um, basically the international cooperation system went missing exactly when we needed it the most. Uh, in those early days when we knew that this was a global crisis, the G20 was absent. Uh, most uh, solutions, oh. that were thoughtful ones, went absent. And in fact, uh, it was the case that countries were actually reneging on their international commitments by imposing ad hoc restrictions to trade on important portions of trade. And we saw the advent of what was then, even though we didn't have a vaccine, vaccine nationalism. Um, many countries, 76 out of 91 in the IMF um, uh, pantheon, uh, had strictures on spending and in fact were under compressive regimes because of the conditions on their loans. And so you found that at a time when rich countries could spend their way out of the problem, poor countries once again could not because they were restricted from doing so. Now, no one's suggesting that uh, poor countries could go the route of rich countries because there would be a currency crisis. But again, the imbalances are indicative. Rich countries spent about 22% of their GDP in post-COVID emergency funding. Uh, emerging markets, 6%, low-income countries, 2%. So you find a sort of expansion of inequalities created by the lack of economic ability to deal with the crisis. And of course, uh, and this is the one that worries me much more, imbalances in the global innovation system, which lead to, number one, uh, a concentration of where R&D and innovation happens, where production happens and ultimately through the global IP regime, how vaccines are distributed and how they're made available. And is it vaccines that are made available or is it the IP? And so we've gone from short-term palliatives such as the $650 billion increase uh, in SDR allocations, which I think is a good step, uh, to asking ourselves what might be the long-term solutions here. And so let me stop on this point since you mentioned architecture that I'd say moving from a regime in which SDR allocations are ad hoc, which is what the current system is, to one where you actually make SDR allocations systematized and ideally countercyclical would be entirely in keeping with the intent of global cooperation, enlightened self-interest for the West, as well as sensible economic theory that we've come to accept domestically at the national level. Uh, second, I think we need much more management of the way IP is created. And since IP is created mostly as a public-private partnership, uh, Operation Warp Speed in the US is a very good example of that. It stands to reason 
that the IP, the resulting IP, then cannot be distributed along purely private sector lines. And so we have to think about IP as a global public good, as a colleague of mine has said, a merit good. And if it indeed is a merit good with public-private characteristics uh, in its funding, then we have to think more carefully in terms of how the vaccines are distributed, how innovation happens globally, and it is ultimately those kinds of long-term structural changes that we need if we need to see our, ourselves through to the next crisis. And so let me end on the point that Marty made, that this isn't all about money. A lot of it is, but it's, it's actually about rethinking the way we treat um, global public goods. It's about rethinking large swaths of humanity and our empathy for them and dealing them into decision making which, uh, as she correctly pointed out, is not just about money, but it is actually about changing the way we think uh, about the collective good. Thank you, Rohinji. And of course, the question can, one can ask here is that we've had crisis of this kind before, not as of this nature, perhaps, but we had one in 2008. Um, but nothing really was done in many ways to reform the international financial uh, architecture. So the question is, will that be happening, will that be happening now? And that we can return to that later on. Uh, I would like to see more questions from the audience. We haven't got as much as yet. What I was wondering is that whether uh, maybe somebody is mute, uh, think perhaps, um, because I can hear uh, an echo. But I was wondering whether any of the panelists would respond to others around what you've heard so far from each other. It would be good to get a conversation going first among five of uh, on the four of you. And while we're waiting for more questions from the audience. Anyone to respond to um, to the what you've heard from your from other panelists? Marty, I think you you wanted to say something. Um, I wasn't actually raising my hand, but I was struck by the complementarity of the, the remarks, and I was struck by the different ways of thinking about inequality and inequity at the country level between countries and within countries at the micro level. Um, and I was intrigued by Rohinton's closing on those figures on how much vaccine per hundred persons and also how much spending on relief and recovering by the country income groups. I think those figures are very sobering and and we have to we really do have to deal with um the inequalities in today's world at the macro and the micro level <clears throat> thank you marty i see a question here from the audience and uh, again to the audience please keep on sending your questions in the q a feature and we are collating the collating the questions here, here. And the question here actually, I think, is perhaps for David to answer. The question is as follows. Do COVID-based development patterns really look so global? I mean, look at how economic innovation processes are reshaping global accumulation centered on US and European-based big pharma and big tech. So at one level, one, one might say there is a global development paradigm. At another level, one sees increasing concentration, especially, in fact, as Robinson mentioned, around innovation and accumulation. So David, would you like to respond to this question? Please, thanks. Um, uh, no, I, I was listening as Rohinton was, was speaking and certainly when one looks at where one can look to apply the old fashioned global north and global south and when one looks at those figures on access to vaccinations and the number of vaccinations uh, for the population, then we certainly do appear to be going back to this binary being able to um, to explain uh, what what um, what's happening, and in terms of the innovation and the processes of research and uh, and development that are occurring, I'd see things um, certainly as having changed from the old idea of domination by North America and Western Europe because of the role of China in these processes and the role of uh, in innovation and in production and the role of India actually in the manufacture of vaccines and India now being so important <coughs> in the pharmaceutical industry and that's that's not the sort of pharmaceutical industry that one certainly used to think about where the innovation and the production um, occurred in Europe and in North America in a way 
The rise of China has dispersed that. The capacity of India to engage with the pharmaceutical industry um, has, um, yeah, has challenged that. Whether this is scratching the surface, I don't know. One would need to certainly look at the, uh, at the recent data because certainly it does look as though um, innovation in vaccines is going to produce more profits for many of the of the big pharma companies. But it's interesting to note on the big pharma the different behaviour of AstraZeneca, which opted for having the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine as a non-profit product. Now, in the sort of north-south imaginings and the role of corporations that I had from international development, one could not imagine Big Pharma sacrificing its profits uh, in a market in which you can clearly make a lot of money um, very uh, short term uh, on the products that have been uh, developed. So I, I, I can see that the evidence is still that those in a way who are wealthy, those countries, those corporations are continuing to uh, to amass the wealth. But I think with the rise of China, with AstraZeneca opting to go for a non-profit uh, approach to it, then we are beginning to see changes that, uh, yeah, that, that one didn't really imagine 25, 30 years ago. Let me come in on that in a couple of ways. Uh, one, by the way, I think it's a very good question because it could be asked even if COVID hadn't happened. And that's because the questioner has astutely caught on to what is the big trend in wealth creation, which is increasingly wealth creation is driven by innovation and proprietary knowledge, i.e. IP. And even before COVID came along, the trend was clear that the wealth embodied in intangibles and IP uh, today around the world is multiples of what it was. And so rates of return to capital and especially soft capital have sort of gone through the roof. And what COVID has done with the stark example of pharma has simply highlighted that, but we're seeing that in almost every endeavor. We're even seeing it and especially seeing it in the climate change field. Imagine if there's a breakthrough technology in some aspect of addressing climate change. We're going to replay the COVID-19 vaccine story all over again. Second, uh, much as I'd like um, to celebrate some of the things David said, let's be clear that the Oxford AstraZeneca case is not quite that straightforward. Um, initially, Oxford University or the, the center there did want to make the vaccine absolutely freely available in the spirit that this was uh, a public-private partnership and indeed was about creating a public good. Uh, and uh, one of the major funders, the Gates Foundation, stepped in for reasons that it believed were valid to prevent that. And then there was a sort of large public debate. And in some senses, the groups were forced into creating a more equitable pricing structure, but they're not giving them away. Uh, when you look at the reports on how opaque the negotiations with Big Pharma, including AZR, the large price differentials uh, inherent in them we do not at all uh, have a system in which we could claim that there's a model out there. And I'd, I'd include China in it. Uh, I think um, vaccine diplomacy, it's not a new phrase, but it took on meaning because China and India were <coughs> practicing it. And they were not practicing it for altruistic reasons, they were practicing it for geopolitical reasons. So there really isn't a shining example of good behavior out there. We should be thinking about creating, and in the past I've often said the example I use is the CGIAR, the International Agricultural Research System, uh, where we uh, create knowledge in the public good and patents are held in the public interest. I think thinking about a CGIAR for aspects of global health research makes sense, but we're far from it. So and actually I wanted to come back to this particular question, you know, on patents, because very quickly the discussion on vaccine distribution in the, in the global south just entered the patents, and I think too quickly. Um, because those who work on foreign investment uh, would argue that it's not so obvious that just by simply lifting patents on vaccines is going to lead to this big production of in, uh, increase in production in vaccines in the global south. Those who work on foreign investment will argue that actually a sort of tacit knowledge that is passed through which uh, multinationals may not really be willing to pass through just purely by lifting patents. And I actually have a lot of sympathy for that argument. And I wondered, well, sometimes I felt that this, this, this particular debate got too polarized and perhaps at times naive. And I just want to, you to respond to this, because I know you've also worked in foreign investment 
uh, in your in previously how would you how would you respond to those who are skeptical of the argument that lifting patents is neither a sufficient condition nor a sufficient uh, neither necessary condition nor a sufficient condition for getting vaccines produced in the global south totally i think you've put it well kunal it is a necessary but not a sufficient condition i i i'd look at it this way so vaccine distribution in the absence of addressing technology transfer is neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition to make progress of any kind it is simply old-fashioned charity or it's a jungle out there so we have to think in terms of technology which is increasingly created not by the private sector taking all the risk in fact it's the public sector that de-risked private sector investments in this and asking ourselves how much of this technology therefore belongs in the public realm number one or number two if it doesn't can we create a system in which innovation happens everywhere and we create science nodes as we've done as i said in agriculture so that we tap the scientific potential everywhere everywhere early on you know there were people saying but the capacity the, the manufacturing capacity doesn't exist and you don't understand these are highly complex processes to create vaccines turns out more and more countries are turning up uh, south africa senegal others where the vaccine production capacity and the hygiene and the other standards do exist and so some of these arguments i think are being made to preserve rents and so i end on the point if this is a game of global rents which it is then either you have a sound technology transfer system or you have a sound system to tax rents we have neither at present i mean i'm completely okay with saying innovation is driven by monopoly profit that's the incentive you need for it to happen well in that case let's not be in this world in which taxes are always ratcheted down and you have tax havens and so on then let's tax monopoly rent sensibly and give the public authorities the resources to provide public goods thank you Rohantin. i'm going to now move to a question from the audience and it's a quite a interesting question which i would ask us fatima to respond to uh, Fatima, the question is and i think i think it goes by the debate of the origins of, of covid19 can biological weapons be developed by using COVID-19 in future wars or conflicts? What are preventive policies, especially perhaps the UN level, to prevent such possibilities? What are your thoughts on this? Uh, we can't hear you, Fatima. Go to unmute yourself, please. Thanks. Yes, um, thanks, Kunal. I as I was saying, I was looking at the question and, and was hoping you can ask me that particular question <laughs> because I don't I don't know much about biological weapons um, and that intersection with COVID-19, in, especially in terms of future wars or conflict. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you now. Just dropped it for, for a few seconds. Thanks. Let, yeah, let, let me let me maybe um, say this. Um, there was a great deal of skepticism in this part of the world. I was in Accra when COVID struck. Um, and the weight of, I would say, religious beliefs, um, spiritual belief systems, um, you know, communal solidarity. There was this sense that, you know, this was not... A, um, a, a pandemic that had anything to do with Africa. And I think we, we saw just how, to a large extent, at, at least at the very initial stages of the, of the pandemic, it seemed like much of Africa was spared. Um, so there was a, a general sense that it was, for the first time, this was happening to another part of the world. Um, and that Africa that is usually, you know, at the sort of, front line of all the wars and conflict was this time not affected. Um, so I think we are seeing a, a kind of shift. Um, I think Matty was talking about the, the, the importance of behavioral change. I think we are seeing that people are dying. The numbers are on a hike, they're going up. Um, and there's definitely a sense that, yes, um, those countries that are 
good progress. And I think Senegal has been mentioned as one of those countries that are making progress in terms of um, innovation, um, need to be encouraged. Um, we don't necessarily have to find solutions in the West. Um, these are not goods and services that, that have to be you know, exported down to the rest of the world. Um, and I think that I recall when there was, um, when the news broke that uh, Madagascar had found um, some cure, you know, that was indigenous based, you know, it, it, it wasn't taken very seriously. But from a Malagasy perspective, this was um, a cure that, you know, they believe was working for them. You know? So I think we're still, there's still that kind of um, a sense of superiority when it comes to science and where scientific goods are sourced. Um, and I think that that in itself is a problem because there are parts of the world in the global south that could also be encouraged to use native skills um, and be able to put some solutions you know, on the table. And more of this has to be done, especially since in this part of the world, we can see that we're not investing enough in R&D. Uh, if you take Africa, for, for, for instance, the whole of Africa is, is producing or contributing to less than 1% of the global scientific goods. Um, and combating this disease, you know, will definitely need innovation, will definitely need science, um, as with many of the other development problems as well. But we do, we do need to kind of shed some of that kind of superiority, um, you know, ways of looking at where solutions can be sourced. Uh, we, we need to find a way of ensuring that the, the science that we are talking about should actually work, would actually work better from a level playing field, you know, a science that is not, you know, not not um, um, indicative or not um, not displaying rather a, a sense of superior, superiority. Absolutely, and I think the point really is that this problem of not taking science seriously it cuts across both the global north and the global south. We saw that in the in the case of the U.S., of course, but there are other examples there, and we of course saw that also in examples that we have from Brazil and many other emerging economies. So this problem of not taking science seriously enough, and then often sort of uh, advocating indigenous solutions, so on, is not a not a specific problem in Africa or in the global south. It's a general. It's a problem we've seen across the board. In fact, David, you've often you have been reflecting a little bit on this sorts of issues. Maybe if you could just respond to this particular question of, of the role of science in the discussion on the pandemic and its and the solutions to it. Um, yeah, no, I mean, unfortunately, I haven't been researching on it, but I think it is something that really needs researching as a priority. Uh, I, I will certainly for, for 2020 and 2021, the way in which science was used and not used and the geography and the way that these different waves have impacted um, upon whether science has been uh, uh, applied or not. But I, I think um, uh, I, I, I partly because I was uh, was locked down in New Zealand. Um, I started off seeing the pandemic from a very rational perspective, where science was used and where policy came in, because science could only partly explain what was happening or likely to happen. Uh, when I returned to the UK, I was somewhat horrified to find it was chaotic, and sometimes the science was being listened to. At other times, then political advisors were saying, "Oh no." that would be bad for the um, the economy. And then watching in the USA, the way that uh, a, a populist president was actually challenging uh, and actually uh, yeah, saying that the science was uh, was wrong without any scientific basis for that. And we could see that reflected, I mean, the US uh, experience reflected in Brazil, UK maybe in India, and then, you know, the good performer, New Zealand, and Vietnam or, or Senegal. So these patterns are, have been um, have been pretty complicated. I mean, the one thing that certainly hits me at the moment, I'm trying to understand why West Africa has managed to to keep reasonably well clear, and we definitely need to look at whether pandemic preparedness because of the 2015 uh, Ebola um, surprise fright um, had actually 
prepared West Africa in ways so that although the countries are low income and lower middle income, they actually were ready and there was some state capacity, relatively limited state capacity, but some state capacity so that testing and tracing and thinking about uh, quarantine and some public um, understanding. But I think that's really important from policy perspective because um, the sort of science of the pandemic has been tremendous how it's accelerated and at times how public it's been, but its application has been so varied around the world and certainly wealthy countries haven't got it right despite their enormous human capital bases, their capacity to innovate and poorer countries haven't got it wrong despite the fact they have populations that are much less educated, populations that are much less likely to be able to believe in uh, in Western types of um, science and the scientific systems that dominate. So I think this is really important because if we're trying to improve policy then it's partly through getting the science listened to uh, much more effectively uh, and Marty there is a question I wanted to ask you in fact the question well, is can actually, I just can sure. I just yeah. respond I, I wanted to say I wanted to bring it the discussion back into the economy and employment and to make a distinction if we can between science and technology right because the poor <laughs> the working poor, see all the technological systems that have been introduced, right? You know, let's say at the city level, uh, the bus rapid transport or uh, any of the systems for energy, you privatize it, all of these technological systems that come in, and now you've got the digital platforms, all of those work for the most part against them, right? So I think we have to remember that the experience of science, so to speak, that the poor face is often the experience of technologies that in the short term, at least for them, are not working particularly well. And from the vantage point of the working poor in the informal economy, you think of how well the digital platforms and the Amazons of the world have done in the pandemic and how poorly they have done. So I think some of the some of the sort of reaction to science is filtered through the reaction of how technology has left them behind. Uh, I agree, Martin, but there's a, but there's a question again for the audience that at the end of the day, when you talk about a better deal for informal workers, who, as you've absolutely rightly connect, uh, noted, that have been affected the the, uh, the most by the pandemic, how can yeah. we think about doing that without addressing va vaccine inequity? In other words, still as, lo as long as we cannot make sure that everyone's fully vaccinated in the global south, including informal workers, how can we talk about a better deal? How can we talk about building back better? I think that's a very important question. And the first thing to realize in al allocating vaccinations like different countries have done you have a first group that gets them and often it, the frontline workers are included in that right but informal workers may not be seen as the frontline workers that they actually are so the street food vendors <laughs> the waste pickers who contribute to sanitizing and have to deal with all the covid waste <laughs> At, at great detriment to their health, we do have to prioritize them in the allocation of, of the vaccinations as frontline workers who cannot work remotely from their home. Now that doesn't address the larger issue of the vaccination apartheid and are we gonna get enough vaccinations out? But I think in the thinking through who should be in that first cohort to get um, the vaccinations. I think the people who do all the essential, uh, produce all the essential goods and services for us, because if nothing else, the COVID crisis has reminded us of the essentials of life, right? I mean, it's food and transport and, um, and sanitation. Um, and if we can prioritize these workers um, in the rollout, I think that is the way to help with recovery because they have to be out and about to work and they are providing essential goods and services. Thank you, Marty. 
I'm going to call this panel to a close now. And I think it's been a really interesting discussion. But I think what I think is quite clear from all that you've said uh, uh, on, on the question of inequity, and that stood out so clearly in the discussion here. And the point really is that, you know, the pandemic may well go, uh, might uh, run its course in the next few years. But the inequities, if we don't do something about it now, when we've learned so much of how we have had the situation of inequity across countries and within countries, within countries, informal workers, across countries, vaccine distribution, macroeconomic balances, uh, supporting countries to make the transitional pathway to re uh, renewable energy, and so on. If you don't do something about that in the next couple of years, unfortunately, we might again be in the situation that we are in in the last year or so. And I think that's really important for the international government to think about, especially as we come towards COP26 in a, in a couple of months' time, that we got to do something about it now. We can't simply think about our situation where this problem that we faced this in this last two years comes back again to haunt us. That's a really important message that we should take to the to the door, especially to the international policy community. So I'm going to uh, get uh, call this panel to a close, but I want to end by thanking some of my colleagues, two particular uh, two people in particular, and in fact I'm going to call them on the on the main stage so that everybody can see them. The two the two individuals that I want to thank especially are Ruby Richardson and Yuta Stenholm. They have played an amazing job role in the whole the way that this conference has been organized backstage. And of course, many of you have been in, uh, dealing with Ruby and and Yuta all the way through the last three days. It's not easy to run a a big conference like this, we had about 200 speakers, so many panels, so many fire chat, side, fire side chats, so many co coffee rooms and so on. Not easy at all. But the way Yuta and Ruby manage everything, making sure with all the you know usual technology glitches that you had once in a while, that things ran so smoothly, it was pretty amazing. Thank you so much, Yuta and Ruby. But of course, also behind the whole conference, there's a whole set of people from wider who acted as chairs, moderators, um, uh, uh, looking after the technology, and many other roles were backstage. It was a tremendous collective effort, exactly as we try and do in, in the, our conference in UNU wider. And so well done job, wonderful job. And uh, I want to finally have to thank a super Finnish company that helped us run this conference platform. I, would, I hope that all of you agree that it was one of the more interactive conferences you might have been to. And we could do that because we have this fantastic conference platform. And the company's name is virtualalitapatumat.fi. I'm sure I got the transition wrong. Apologies for that. Um, I don't know whether Yano can come on stage now. Yano Warisalo is, Waris, uh, Warisalo is the CEO of the company. He's been so important for us in this conference. And he's been supported by his colleague, Susan Salo, the project manager, Amanda Tukanen, project manager, and Rika Haiskanen, account manager. Yeah, no, I don't know if you can come on stage now because they all can see you and your colleagues. If not, we, we can just thank you and thanks so much for, again, the support that you've given us. Um, I have to say that, uh, you know, when we thought about this conference, we wanted to do something different. We didn't want to have the same kind of conference that we have been having for the last two years, the online conference where mostly been academics presenting papers. We wanted to have interactive sessions. We wanted to make it as much as a typical wider conference and we have it in person. And I would hope that you felt that we did our best um, in trying to create this interactive kind of uh, uh, a conference where you got to know new people, you got to listen to some very interesting fireside chats, you got to, uh, to speak to somebody virtually and so on. So I hope you got that sense of what a wider conference is about. And hopefully next time, next time, we could do it in person. And as you also know, when WIDER finishes one conference, Uni WIDER thinks about the next conference. And the next conference is going to be taking place, hopefully, in a hybrid format in Helsinki in May. It will be on conflict and development. And, and we'll announce, of course, again, a call for papers and everything else in the conference uh, so, so, uh, quite well, reasonably soon. And uh, so, you know, we're already thinking about the next conference. But thanks so much to the audience, because it was really so nice to see so much involvement from you through the different sessions that we had the last three days. Sometimes the sessions ran quite late from your point of uh, timing, your time zone, perhaps. That's the way we had to do this uh, online conferences. But your participation in the last three days was amazing. 
and thank you so much for that and hope to see you all in the next wide UNU wider conference that will happen in May of next year thank you. thank you and thanks so much sorry I should also thank Roy, uh, Rowinton, Marty, Fatima and David for, mm -hmm. for and I know that for some of you it's also quite late or pretty early in the morning thank you so much we'll call to see you soon bye thank you Thank you. Thank you.